Okay. <clears throat> okay, the uh, June 15th Sedona Fire District meeting is now in session. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing for a moment of silence. We've lost 18 police officers and four firefighters to the line of duty since our last meeting. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> okay. So our first items on our agenda right now are to uh, vote to go into executive session. We have a couple items to discuss over there. Um, for legal advice, pursuant to ARS 38431.03A3, and possible instructions to legal counsel pursuant to ARS 38431.03A4. In regards, in regards to the Sedona Fire District's lease with Sedona Oak Creek Airport Authority. Also, uh, vote to go into executive session for legal advice pursuant to ARS 38431.03A3 and possible instructions to legal counsel pursuant to ARS 38431.03A4 in regards to the lease amendment with AT&T for fire station four generator access. Uh, do I make a motion to go into executive session? So move. So move. That's a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Any uh, opposed? Okay. We are now in executive session. All set? Okay. We are back in open session. <clears throat> As a result of executive session, uh, we have two, two motions to make. First one being uh, a move to approve uh, the lease amendments with AT&T for Fire Station 4 generator access uh, as, as described. Uh, do I have a second for that motion? Second. Do we have any further discussion on that? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is, is passed. The second motion is uh, in regards to the Sedona Fire District lease with the Sedona Oak Creek Airport Authority. It is a, a motion that is a little bit lengthy and technical, and I will refer to legal counsel to make that motion for me, for the board. Mr. Chair, please, the board, if the board decides it wants to move forward with the modified version of the airport tower agreement, you may want to consider a motion that reads similar to the following. Uh, motion to authorize the board chair in consultation with legal counsel and the fire chief to make final review and modifications to the proposed draft airport tower lease agreement. in conjunction therewith incorporate language which is intended to reflect the concerns raised by the airport authority in their recent email and upon satisfactory modification of the same to execute that agreement to submit Thank you. Uh, that is so moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that motion is passed. Thank you, Bill, for, for that. <clears throat> okay, uh, we are going to now reconvene and back into uh, our public budget hearing is our first item up here or I should say our next item up. And let me get my document here. So Mr. Chair, please board my apologies for the uh, litigation I have to see to, so I'll excuse myself and head on back. 
Thank you. Yes, you are excused. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the public budget hearing. And this is uh, where we hold an open public hearing for the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. And uh, with that, there are some rules that we do have to follow, so I will read these so that we're all on the same page. The open, to open the public hearing for proposed fiscal year uh, 2022 budget, any individual making comments shall first give their name and address. This is required because the official record of a public hearing is being made. It is not necessary to be a proponent or an opponent in order to speak. Any, anyone disrupting the proceedings may be subject to removal from the meeting. These rules are intended to promote an orderly system of holding a public hearing to give every person an opportunity to be heard. Chief, do we have any, anyone from the public present for comment? No, we do not, sir. Okay, with that said, uh, the next item on there is a response from the staff to any public comment which there is none, so we get to move forward with that. Now we're at the uh, next item that is the uh, discussion possible action for the proposed fiscal year 2022 budget. And with that, there is a resolution 2021-02, which is the approval of the fiscal year 2022 budget, including the salary scale. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and read this, this uh, resolution. It's but one page and only a few, few paragraphs, but it's important to know to what extent this budget covers. And this is resolution 2021-02, approval of the fiscal year 2022 budget. A formal resolution of the governing board of the Sedona Fire District to adopt the 2022 fiscal year budget of $19,736,145 to encumber sufficient funds to cover outstanding items, such as purchase orders and checks, et cetera, from the previous fiscal year, less any cash and liability reserves, and to encumber any carryover amount to offset taxes, less any unreimbursed stop or lost payments, and any adjustments for uncollected out-of-district fire revenues incurred prior to June 30, 2022. Establishing the balance to be utilized as our fiscal year, year-end reserve fund balance, as per the Sedona Fire District policy, 2014-02 fund balance. Whereas Arizona revised statute title 48 requires the Sedona Fire District to prepare an annual budget that contains detailed estimate expenditures for each fiscal year and that clearly shows salaries payable to employees of the district. And whereas the budget summary has been posted in three public places and a complete copy of the budget published on the district's official website for 20 days for public hearing. And whereas a, a public hearing was held on the proposed 2022 fiscal year budget on June 15, 2021, in compliance with state law. And whereas the Sedona Fire District wishes to encumber and carry over amounts to remain in the general fund as our fiscal year end reserve fund balance to be maintained and to allow the F Sedona Fire District to continue providing services to the community in case of economic downturns and or unexpected emergencies or requirements and to provide working capital in the first several months of the fiscal year until sufficient revenues are available to fund operations. Therefore, it is hereby resolved that the Sedona Fire District's governing board adopt the 2022 fiscal year budget of $19,736,145 at a tax rate of 2.4888, which is $2.48, included in the 2022 including the 2022 wage scale and encumber sufficient funds to cover outstanding items, purchase orders, and checks, et cetera, any cash and liability reserves and any carryover amounts to offset taxes, less any unreimbursed stop loss payments and any adjustments for un uncollected out of date fire revenues incurred prior to June 30th, 2022 to remain in the general fund as our fiscal year and reserve balance. That was a mouthful. <laughs> um, so, 
So I so move to approve the fiscal year 2022 budget through resolution 2021-02. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any further discussion? I'd like to add something during this discussion. First and foremost, this is our opportunity to say whatever we feel about our budget, our budget process, and and uh, and I, I do want to comment on that. Again, Chief, uh, I, I want to address it to you in particular that your staff, including our finance uh, department, if you will, um, the labor associations, and this board has gone through an unending series of events to get to where we're at. And it started back in uh, April, early April. And it's been nonstop. And I have, I can only say thank you to you and to the staff, to the countless hours that they put together on this, uh, and to the general public that this amount, we looked at every line item and every penny I personally made phone calls to our finance people to ensure that we were, were headed in the right direction each each and every time something came up. Uh, the cost to operate this type of fire service, this district in this community is not cheap and we are utilizing every penny to its fullest extent. Make no doubt about that. Um, several years ago, we listened to the public. We took a different approach on how we uh, look at our financing institution and how we deal with it. And we made changes. And today we see a result that is as comprehensive as any budget is going to get. And again, on behalf of the board, I want to say thank you, extend our thank yous to all your staff, including yourself, uh, for all the work they did. So thank all you guys. Uh, any other further statements? It's well said. Chairman. Well said. Well said. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, with that said, uh, the motion's before us. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion is passed. I also like to show for the record that the, rec uh, the vote was four to zero with one vacancy uh, currently existing. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. <clears throat> Next item on the agenda. Chief, we have presentations of awards and staff recognition. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Chair Board. Good evening. And it's our uh, honor to recognize one of our employees for 10 years of service as Rich Scala. He's in our IT department, we all know. And our IT department does an outstanding job we have a lot of work to do to keep us communicating and, and keep us in touch and keep us advancing our technology, and Rich is a big part of that. He began his employment back in June 20th of 2011, and he was hired as a telecommunications technician, too. Uh, he's had a couple of special recognitions over the years. One was a 2014 unit citation for a slide rock response and 2015 customer service award which uh, is fitting. Rich, uh, he received education in the U.S. Marine Corps in avionic, as an avionics technician. He also became a certified journeyman, electronics technician, and wireless communications and installer. So he does definitely have the, ex, uh, the expertise and the experience and education background. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps from 1984 to 88 as an aircraft communication system technician. So, we all know Rich, uh, he works super hard and he's a pretty quiet guy, but uh, be, he's kind of like a, a duck that floats across the water and you go, how beautiful and good looking duck and he's floating and just really relaxed. But under the water, he's pedaling really hard. And, and I, I think that hard pedaling is what keeps us doing really well on our communications and radio and, so we congratulate him, appreciate him, and uh, it's just an honor to take a moment just to acknowledge him. Thank you, Chief. Um, it, it, 
he's one of uh, one of those employees now that is entering that middle part of their career in a 30 year uh, career and that's where we really get a hold of and benefit from those employees that first 10 years they learn their craft they know it now we're going to become the benefactor as a result of that uh, for this next 10 years I'm looking forward to him doing bigger and better things and uh, hope to see his name down the road some more anybody else comment oh, um, as a board member I'm very much aware that IT technology drives uh, this district I mean the ability to communicate under real really strange uh, climate as well as um, geographic uh, environment means that IT is what really is the butter on our bread and so I'm extremely appreciative of this gentleman's uh, technological skills and expertise um, because I rarely hear of the fire district having any lapses in ability to communicate and use IT such as the drones and and uh, and some of these other uh, um, evolutions of technology that really um, puts the fire district on the leading edge of this industry. Good. Thank you, Al. Gene, any comments? Just a comment, not about Sedona Fire, but it uh, has something to do with Sedona Fire and, and communication. I sent to, I believe, to you, Chief, and others a recording of the events at Station 82 in Los Angeles County Fire Department, a shooting that occurred within a fire station. Uh, the resultant um, communications involving law enforcement, fire service, and, and um, other allied support personnel throughout the entire area was dramatic. And without, um, without people like we have in this community, for that community, have you, it could have been disastrous uh, for, from, on many fronts, including public relations. So it's, uh, the communication is more than just putting the wet stuff on the hot stuff and saving people and so on. It has a, a lot of issues out there that uh, dealing with uh, first response communities. And that one, uh, that particular recording should go down in history. My comment. Thank you, Jean. Janet, anything? No, I'm just <clears throat> proud of, of him as well. And um, you were saying halfway through his career, still, still getting Good. better of him. So. Okay. Well, please express our uh, congratulations when you do see him. And uh, thank you for all the hard work. Thank you. And thank you, Rich, if you're watching. <laughs> okay, regular business meeting, uh, public forum. Again, uh, Chief, are there any uh, citizens out there willing to, to speak? No, there are not. Okay. It's a matter of making sure we cross our T's and dot our I's, right? Uh, consent agenda. Uh, before us on our consent agenda, we have the May 18th, 2021 regular meeting minutes the May 18, 2021 executive session minutes, and the annual acceptance of pension funding policy. Um, I would like to pull number three, which is the annual acceptance of pension funding policy, and discuss that uh, immediately after the consent agenda approval. Um, so with that said, uh, do I I'll make a motion to approve items one and two of the consent agenda? Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Any further uh, comments? All in favor of approving the consent agenda? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda is approved. Uh, the annual acceptance of pension funding policy. Uh, I'd like just a little refresher, a little update on that. I was hoping, uh, Gabe, that maybe you can do that with, through the chief. Yep. Gabe, you can do that for us. Yep. 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 All right. Um, good afternoon. I'm Mr. Chairman of the board. Um, about two years ago, I believe the legislator came out and, um, you know, kind of said that, you know, these, these government pensions are, are growing a lot in liability, um, and it's not really at the forefront of uh, everybody's discussion. Um, and so the legislator came out and said, you know, fire departments or anybody that has an unfunded pension liability or has a pension liability needs to adopt an annual policy every year that recognizes, one, explains what that liability is, 
recognizes how much that liability is, and then has a policy on how you know we're going to fund that li that that, that uh, liability. Um, and so right now the document before you is, is similar to the one that was adopted the prior two years as well. Um, the unfunded liability or the liability and funded ratios has been updated mm -hmm. um, based on the current uh, funding ratios. And you know, simply our policy is that our goal is to be 100% funded by June 30th of 2036, which is based on our amortization schedule of our unfunded liability, but that we will evaluate on a regular basis additional monies that we're able to put towards that liability to in an attempt to retire that earlier than that target date of 2036. Right. Okay. So with that, um, that's what we have before you today. All right. And the, the 2036, um, 15 years? Is that what that is? Is that the math is yeah, right? So 15 years. Okay. So it, what are we putting into it currently to meet that goal? So um, we have, when, when we budget, when we do our budget every year, um, we get a PSPRS contribution rate. Mm -hmm. That rate is divided into two components. One, the normal pension cost, and then the unfunded liability cost. Correct. So our normal pension cost is about 15%. I apologize, I don't have it right at the front of me, but I believe our unfunded, um, our total cost is about 34% per dollar of, of, of pensionable wages. And so that means we're paying about 20% of our pensionable wages into PSPRS to pay down that unfunded liability. And so the adopted just budgeted, just the budget just adopted for next year, we've got a total budget to PSPRS of 3.2 million. Okay. Of that con containing our normal pension costs, as well as pay down on that unfunded liability. Okay, gotcha. Okay, and it's it's always good to get a review of that, you yeah. know, because it, again, it, the numbers like that they just <laughs> kind of go into <laughs> cyberspace. But but thank you for that that update. Cool. With that said, uh, I move to approve the annual acceptance of the pension funding policy. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Uh, any further discussion? Any questions for Gabe on that? Okay, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion pass. Uh, next up on the agenda is the financial report and updates from our director of finance, Gabe Boldra. All right. Well, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. As soon as this loads, we'll uh, we'll get started here. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. Technology is a wonderful thing uh, when it works. Oh, your internet's unstable. Did not memorize. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, starting off with um, our tax levy revenue, which will be popping up here in a second, uh, we brought in 693928 in tax revenue for the month. Go a little slower here. It's still not popping up. We were about 25000 under um, our projection for the month. We're looking, looking pretty good when we get to the, the total numbers in totality. Um, non levy revenue was at 228370 which was under budget by 31000 And um, really, uh, non levy revenues, really what's driving that variance right now is our ambulance. We, um, there it is. We've, uh, we, we are billing now through the new billing company, um, but revenues are still kind of, you know, there's still going to be that lag, which we we're aware of, and, and we knew it was coming. So we're about, you know, 25000 under what we projected on, on AMBO revenue for the month. So that's really kind of really driving that variance there on all of the revenues. Looking at expenses, uh, across the board, you'll see um, all of our major expense categories are under budget with the exception of vehicles and equipment. Um, I will point out what's kind of buried in personnel is we did run over a little bit on, on overtime costs for the month of um, May. However, we had savings in other categories within personnel, so the net was still up under budget for personnel. Um, but just with regular vacancies, opportunity and out, and then um, also, kind of start now, we're starting to catch up on all of our training, um, and so we're starting to burn some of that over time uh, for that rope rescue training and stuff. Um, looking at vehicles and equipment, so another category that was actually over budget as a whole for the month of May at $65,638. Um, that $16,000 variance is really being driven by our PIXIS fees, which is the essentially the machine um, at the hospital that has all the, the medications the paramedics get locked into it. And we got billed from June through April, um, and that all hit in May. So they finally got kind of caught up on that. So uh, it was 
all budgeted dollars, but more of a timing on, on when that hit. So, moving on to your today, that'll probably take a few minutes to load as everyone else does. We're looking, um, our total revenue is at just over 19 million. Um, and of that 19 million, our property tax collection is sitting right at 15.6 million, which is actually 66,000 over where we projected to be at this point. So kind of, as I mentioned, we're in a good shape from a year to date standpoint. Um, Non-levy revenues is even stronger at 3.4 million, uh, which is uh, 663,000 over where we projected to be um, for the year. So while we have some, you know, some shortfalls that I've mentioned on the ambulance side, between wildland and grants revenue, they're really outperforming, and so that's helping us offset um, that, that deficiency we're seeing on the ambulance revenue right now. And again, it's not that we're not going to get the ambulance revenue, it's just kind of a function of timing mm -hmm. when we see that. Looking at our expenses, um, our total expenses are at $16,031,000. Uh, we are over budget by 293000 but as I mentioned, we have those variances on the revenue as well, and so personnel is at uh, 13.4 million, which is over budget by 226,000. And wildland deployment wages are driving that variance. And so while we have that overage on the personnel costs, we have the overage on the revenue to help offset that. Um, so we're still a net positive on that. And you can see all other major categories are under budget uh, through the month of May. And with the exception of managerials at 1,053,000 are over budget by 289,000. Um, and that variance is being driven by that grant expense that I mentioned is, is kind of also offsetting our grant revenue. So, um, well, any variances we have, negative variances we have on, on the expense side, we have the revenue to kind of cover those expenses. So we're in good shape. So that revenue that will cover that isn't, or is it the, the carryover from maybe the, the, the current into the, the new year, or is it, is, how is it? So what will happen, so, well, for example, the grants, the grant revenue that came in, the grant expense we incurred, was actually a carryover from a prior year grant that didn't get, get didn't get funded in time okay. in, the, in the year. So that's why we see the budget variance because we actually had it budgeted for the prior year, um, and then that that revenue, so to speak. So that's a kind of a net zero to us, so to speak. But then on the wildland side, where we have the additional revenue, additional expenses, there's actually a net positive which will create carryover for us that'll come and go into the next year's funding. Okay, so it's just a perpetual carryover from one from one budget into the next until we get funding from the county. Exactly, it's like when you read the resolution, Mr. Right. Chair, and we talked about the fund balances and encumbering funds to be able to offset in not only kind of the unforeseen things, but also that cash flow for the first half of the year while we're waiting on our, our first half taxes. Got it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so percentage of expenses, which you're not going to be able to see, I'm going to get the report before it pops up, I'm sure. <laughs> we, um, we've expended 94% uh, with 6% remaining. We've got, you know, one month left in the budget year. So, so again, we're in good shape. The excess that's been utilized has been covered, has revenue to cover that cost. So. Uh, percentage of expenses as far as the distribution, uh, personnel is our highest at 84%. Um, followed by operations and managerial both at 6% and communications at 4%. And finally, we ended the year with 13.5 uh, in total cash uh, compared to, I should say year, end of the month, 13.5 compared to 11.9 the prior year. Our other assets increased from 20.7 to 21.3. And our total liabilities increased from 26.8 to 29.1. And that's important considering the pension policy you just adopted. The majority of that increase is related to, to our, right. our pension liability. So with that, I'll be happy to answer your questions, Board House. <clears throat> now you answer my questions that I had. Anybody else have any questions for Gabe? No, okay. So with that, um, we need a motion to approve the finances for these would be the May finances, right? Correct. Correct. Uh, I'll move to approve the, the May uh, financial monthly financial report uh, as presented uh, by Gabe Boldra. So I have a second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The monthly uh, finance report is approved. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>
Next up on the agenda is our staff items, which is essentially our fire chief's report. Chief Troutwine. Thank you, Mr. Chair and board. I will draw your attention to the fire chief's report for this month. And as we look at our 2021 monthly incident summary, looking at the year-to-date totals, we're at 1,946 responses. And last year, at this point, we're at 1,658. So again, I think last year was a bit of an anomaly, but we're definitely seeing an increase. Uh, we're experiencing that week to week with call volume. One, one area I want to bring to your attention is we're at 81 rescues here today, and last year we we're at 28. So you've seen our social media post, you've seen some of the incidents we've been responding to on our trail rescue. So, just real quick on that, and I'm sure it'll be referenced later, but uh, especially with these heat temperatures, when travelers come into Sedona and you want to hike the trails, uh, be sure you work within your limitation that you are fit for that type of trail, that you are well hydrated, that you take lots and lots of water and reserve water, that you know exactly where you're at. Um, a lot of the rescues have been heat exhaustion related. so. Uh, a lot of these trails, we, there isn't a lot of shade. I mean, I suppose you can go off trail and find a tree. We don't recommend going off trail. Certain trails, there are, is more shade. So if you don't know the area and you come in to hike, that's great. But if you can't leave really early in the morning, enjoy it when it's a little cooler, then get off the trail. You, you need to be prepared. So we've been putting out some information, social media every time. She's doing a great job. It really outlines some of the way to prepare that. But I, I do want to note that those those rescues are they're staff and time intensive, so they're not like an EMS assignment where you know, someone with a minor injury that you treat, transport, and you're done within a number of minutes. Sometimes these rescues could take three or four hours. So, big point of reference there on the overall. And then and again, we're trying to get our data conform with ESO so we get a better presentation on some of these graphs. If you go down to responses by station, pretty consistent with past. You'll note those station five and six, though, they did have some uptick in some of those responses again. And remember, conceptually, with five stations, once committed on a, a response, the secondary response comes in that area, then another station has to respond and handle that. So that's not uncommon in our district where the calls are distributed, with, especially with the rescues. Any questions on that? Very good. Chief, hang on. I got yes, I got I got two questions. One, um, do we have any documentation on, on how many additional I mean I see the numbers there, but how is this affecting the crews with, with response times and the number of calls when they're a secondary call into another district? I mean, is it are we getting I guess we also had another chart that showed the total number of responses that were up dramatically. And it's also part of the fact that everybody's coming out of being quarantined now and we got a heat wave going on. So I guess that kind of answers my own question. But the second question I had was, we're responding to these rescues of people on the trail that are at a pace that they know and they succumb to the heat to whatever degree they do. We go on these, meaning the firefighters, and they're in a response mode where they're just not casually walking, they're at a higher pace. Do the, do the firefighters have all the resources they need to maintain hydration, to maintain everything they're going to need so that they themselves don't become a patient or a victim? Right. Uh, that's a very good question, and the answer would be yes. So the way our apparatus and equipment is set up, to, we have the most efficient equipment. Some examples are the new basket and wheels we purchased. In fact, the whole setup weighs about what the old wheel did. So one, we've created some efficiency there. Second thing is with the handles on that, when you get smooth trail, two people can move that along instead of the four or six if you have a larger person. And then, you know, we, we they have hats to protect from the sun. You've seen our, our long sleeve hiking shirts, so don't fire that are bright green. Yeah. Well, it's very nice if they're bright green, you can identify our people, and or if we're doing a helicopter rescue, you can see our people. But it provides UV protection. 
You know, they're lightweight, they breathe. Our troops like wearing those, so again, long-term exposure to the sun and heat, it provides protection. So, and they know to hydrate, they have plenty of water, they hike in a lot of water, and they have reserved water, we're very good about that. Sometimes we find people on the trail, on the hike out, that aren't prepared and we give them even more water. So, I think uh, since it's, it's the type of rescue that we do very commonly, we have our apparatus and equipment set up for effectiveness and efficiency. Our firefighters know how strenuous it can be. You know, doing one rescue taking three hours, but going available, turning around, and going to a second one. Okay, so the captains have to keep very cognitive of the crew and where they're at. And the battalion chiefs do a very good job of that in terms of resources and managing and do we need more help. So uh, I, we're very aware of it. And then we have an uptick in the heat. It is very demanding. but firefighters know to come in rested, come in prepared, not just hydrated, but have nutrition in your body too, so it can absorb some of that water and process it. So uh, I think for this type of rescue, we yes, we have what we need. Yes, we are well equipped. And yes, our firefighters do an exceptional job. Yeah. Good. Thank Another you. Comment. A comment over here. Just a comment. Um, um, I participate in parades around Arizona in a rather heavy uniform. And I found um, um, a jacket that is actually a vest, rather, uh, open on the sides with um, inserts that are frozen, reducing core temperature. They're used for people working in hot environments and in industry, and of course, I mentioned wearing a costume or wherever. The key is reducing the core temperature and maintaining it and so on. And you maintain it through hydration. So anyway, it's just a thought. Um, uh, in case somebody out there listening, you might want to investigate that because it's kind of cool. <laughs> Matter of fact, Literally. It, is, it is cool. <laughs> no, and I appreciate that input. And I think uh, we're always looking at ways to improve these operations and what we do. You know, and, and with technology and equipment, it really does help. Well, thank you for that input. Chief? Um, yes, sir. I have a lot of connection with uh, the Chamber of Commerce and the way they communicate with our visitors, either through the visitor uh, center up in Uptown or actually because of our contact with all the hotels and the ability to communicate. Is there something that the fire district can recommend to the Chamber or some uh, protocol or something that where we could be more proactive to make tourists who hike in the summer when it's 100 degrees know, for example, hike at 6 in the morning, not 6 in the evening, and uh, that if you don't bring enough water and if you're not wearing the right type of shoes, uh, you could easily get yourself in serious uh, trouble. I'm just wondering, is there something that we could be partnering with the chamber more to be that linkage right directly to the tourist, other than the day trippers who we don't get talk to very much. Um, you know, a lot of people do stay in the hotels. Hotels are still busy. Airbnbs are busy. Curious. Yes, sir. And I think that's a, a, another great piece of input. Uh, and there, we could definitely feed them information. I know uh, Chief Baker was working on some really good social media posts, um, some of his hiking issues and heat related. We definitely have the ability to feed them information. So we should open up the channel as much as possible so that their social media efforts mirrors your social media efforts. I pick up on some of the posts, but that's just me as a person. Not the chamber has an uh, outreach that's phenomenal. The number of uh, social media contacts they have, um, I'm just surprised because I heard this yesterday in a dialogue talking to tourists, and you know, look, that one little bottle of water is not going to do it. And what are you doing wearing flip flops? You know, and because they encounter this at the chamber um, visitor center, and sometimes the, the visitors get upset that you call them out on this. So I mean, like, who are you to talk to me? You know, and uh, and and then it results in an emergency rescue two hours later. Yeah, I think we certainly could provide more information, to make that connection. I think that's a great suggestion. You know, and it, it is challenging having 4 million travelers come through this area every year. 
because they're not necessarily going to get on our social media or go to the chamber and do their due diligence. I think the, the local people and the people that are repeat travelers, they start to get a little more aware and understand. So, you know, anything we can do to get the word out, keep it out. You know, obviously, this week is incredibly challenging. So, unless you're an extreme hiker and you know how to hydrate 104 degrees, just go early, stay at home, get <laughs> hydrated. It will cool off, and, and you know, the trails are going to be there. <laughs> they won't change much over time. So, but I appreciate that's really good input. Hey, that that it? Yes. Okay. Uh, Excellent. So we'll uh, I'll turn it over to our director of administrative services, Heidi Robinson. Okay. So I put up the picture of the big wheel while you're talking about it because there it is, and we're talking about spending and buying and all that stuff. One of the. Excuse me, one minute, Heidi. Could you do us a favor and maybe just remove the mask sure. while you speak because it'll make it a I'm little better. bit. If that's I'll okay. That's so much better. <laughs> All right. So we'll start with news and events. Um, we've been trying to coordinate some Stop the Lead program um, through the operations, and we came up with the date. This is actually just what's bothering me. I'm going to leave it out here and talk louder. Um, the, we tried to come up with some dates for administration to kind of complete our ASHER program, so the active shooter program that we did last year, and I guess we was a little over that. Um, and so we're still coordinating that with the administrative team. Um, we are going to be bringing our office staff back from remote status. So most of us are back all the way. Um, some are still doing a little bit of a, of a mixed remote schedule. And as of July 1, we're going to bring everyone back. And so we hope that without conflicts, we'll see that there will probably be conflicts with wildland. But we'll get that Stop the Bleed training on the schedule. And basically, that's just um, completing our training. We've got the PACs already in the office. And then they're going to go through um, that basic training with us so that we've got everything we need uh, in case there were an incident on site and we needed to manage until emergency response could get to us. Gene? How many packs? We have one on each floor. Good. All right. Um, annual report. We're, hey, it's been a weird year, hasn't it? Uh, lots of stuff to report. And then, oddly enough, maybe not as much stuff to report as you would think because. None of our regular things were there. So um, Carrie Tarver's taken a lot of time and effort working with staff and operations um, to try to make a, a, a compelling report like we're used to having on a very unusual year. And the work on that is wrapping up and we'll have something to present to the board on our July board meeting. So we'll get that final wrapped up for the year. Anything else that has needed to be reported specifically budgetarily um, was all reported on schedule on time. This is just that, that the nice presentation of it uh, for the files that will go in there. Um, our UKG Kronos update, so that's our integrated payroll timekeeping and HR portal. We are completely out of the development phase for that now, so now we are in implementation. So payroll has been live for quite some time um, with timekeeping and approval going through. And now all of the HR functions have been, um, have been developed and now it's just implementing them. So we'll be doing those one portal at a time. Uh, the first portal that became effective was for our open enrollment for our benefits, for our health benefits selection. That happened through that portal and that was a successful run of that. So there were some glitches and of course we always have those things getting them cleaned up. So Branda Brothers and Payroll and Benefits has been working with our, our health provider and then also with UKG and of course Jeremy Harris to, to get all of that put together. Kiona will continue to build and implement each um, piece of it so we're going to look forward to doing our new hire selection through that as well. So now everything is going to go through um, UKG, the HR portal, instead of it just being singular documents that are scanned and signed and put into a paper file. They're going to go through our timekeeping and benefits portal. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and then the last piece in our news and events is the AFTA schedule. So the Arizona Fire Districts and Fire Chiefs Associations will meet in person uh, this coming year. So I know uh, a lot of people are really looking forward to getting together, getting to see our colleagues from around the state and see our vendors uh, and, and, um, and get things back together to collaborate do some learning and some training together. So that happens that first week in July. Um, if you're interested, board members are interested in attending that conference, 
um, go ahead and do coordinate through CARI and we'll help get you all situated. If you do need to do your board training, it is still available online or they're doing it in person. So that, that they've opened up that option to us. So um, I know that the fire chief does intend uh, to go. I plan on attending a chief Missoula's, I believe Where's also. It's where, uh, it's down in Glendale. It is a regular location down there. Um, and then, uh, so we'll assume that winter will also be on. That's that one that takes place um, in Laughlin. But uh, the local the local one this summer, where it's nice and hot, since we're talking about. I can okay. hardly wait. Now it's good. Um, so if you have any questions about that, though, just contact Carrie or myself, and we'll help you with that. On our staffing updates, the only real update we have in that, and I'm sure we'll hear some more from Ed, uh, the firefighter recruitment, so that whole process is complete. They're um, going through the results of the firefighter assessment center, which was last week, um, and getting those results together to get ourselves a, a valid list. We do have active positions to fill from that list, so we're really, we've heard excellent feedback from the assessors that we've got a really great candidate list coming, so we look forward to the final results on that. Um, update next on the list is surplus spending. So in your packet, we have the updated spreadsheet, uh, and then it has a, a secondary page included this time that is the building details. We've added um, a couple projects. So Chief Lukowski for buildings has um, identified some projects that we want to try to do. We the, the things that we've been trying to work through on that surplus spending is we've encountered situations where vendors don't have product, they can't manufacture. We haven't been able uh, to do some of our technology pieces because of that reduction in staff that we continue to have in the IT department. It would be burdensome to do some of those changes we'd hope to do. So we've kind of um, taken a little bit of a spend on, we don't want to, we've allocated the funds, we've approved them for spending, thank you so much, and so we're using them in places where we can. And in one of those projects, actually two of those projects uh, apply to building and maintenance and it's getting our HVAC system upgraded in this building, in the uh, administrative building. It's been a patchwork of ductwork and HVAC systems that doesn't cooperate, it's not efficient, it's not economical. And so it's been on the docket for some time to fix it. It's come to a head and so it's, um, it was a request through uh, one of the MOU negotiations to look into expediting that project. We've gotten a great, a great bid, a great contract pricing on it, so you'll see the uh, requisition for that and it's um, getting that booked and the reallocation of the funding there you can see also in that detail. The secondary piece in that detail that is new that we hadn't discussed before but it's been identified due to perhaps a more significant delay in the Station 4 remodel, rebuild, relocation mm -hmm. due to building availability since the, um, the difficulty in getting product during COVID. Um, we see that there's a necessity for safety, uh, for cleanliness, to do some flooring abatement in Station 4. And so we want to get that accomplished. And so that's been added in there. They've also gone out to bid for that project, got us our lowest bid. And so you can see the reallocation of our one line item in the spreadsheet for the Office 365 conversion that we thought we might try to do from our, our, our email and our SharePoint and all of that. Um, that's just not feasible this year with that, those monies. Um, almost to the dollar that funding can be reallocated and get these building expenses taken care of. So we're excited to be able to accomplish it. We really appreciate um, Captain Ford and Chief Lukowski's efforts to kind of spearhead and move those projects forward and get us and get us some good pricing, accomplish it while we have the funds available. So those are the updates in there. If you do have questions on those, I'm happy to answer them. Hopefully that setup did that for you. Um, otherwise, we can reach out and get that taken care of. Um, if there aren't any, no, then we'll just kind of close it off as I usually do with the mental health moment. It is June is typically men's health month. It is when we celebrate Father's Day, and so it seems to make sense that we would honor um, the men in our lives by considering their health. And so this is your friendly reminder to get all your checks if you haven't already gotten them done. We've been talking about sun and excessive heat. Uh, so I will remind you it's not Skin Cancer Awareness Month, but definitely do get your spots checked. Go and get, um, get your skin checked out because skin cancer is the most 
It's the most preventable and it's the easiestly treated of any of them that affect um, our guys out there in the sun. So <laughs> take care of that. Wear your sunscreen. Wear your sun shirts. And um, and then and get your physical and get you know get in there and all of that. Um, it is not a surprise to me that in uh, conjunction with Men's Health Month is also PTSD Awareness Month. And for us in particular, um, and for a lot of professions that are predominantly male, uh, there's also some effects on that. On if you're working as a first responder, if you're working in combat, if you're working in um, police, if you're working in fire, as we do, military, veterans, all of that, um, just see some traumatic things and experience traumatic things. We've talked about traumatic things on our trails this week, and that, that can affect you. So um, don't ignore your symptoms. Talk to your provider. Uh, mental health, physical health, it all is together in wellness, uh, full men's health. So talk about things, get the resources you need. If, you, if any of our people need them, we've got them. So. Uh, that's it for me. I'm end of report. Any questions or comments? We'll take them now. Quick question: How many uh, firefighters are we looking to hire? I think that we're at four confirmed. Three confirmed. There's your mic. Yeah, right now in terms of FTEs available, it is three for sure. Possibly four, which would depend upon who fills the open CRR inspector position. Mm. In other words, if it's a summit from the sworn side, which we prefer, then that would be four. So we're hoping it'll be four. And again, one of those depend upon a retirement, a pending one that someone says they are retiring. So, you know, until we get that paperwork. Yeah. But three to four, hopefully. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. Chief? Thank you, Heidi. So. I'm going to keep staff on its toes. I know uh, Chief Coyle is actually uh, he's trying to multitask because <laughs> right now at 5 o'clock, 1700, we have a Cornfield Fire briefing. They're uh, IC, so he's going to be online with that, and I know he's listening to me right now. But So I'm going to skip him, and then we'll come back to him. That'll give him the opportunity on the front side of that briefing to see if anything has changed with that fire. Uh, hopefully they had a good day on it. Uh, I think I had given more email update, but we looked pretty good last night. So, so Chief Coyle, continue with your briefing, and I will jump to Division Chief Davis and CRR. Thank you, Chief. Uh, as you can see, I actually was paying attention, and I didn't have to jump too fast. So, thank you for that. Good afternoon, board members, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Board Member Camello, a great idea on the chamber. In fact, I've written myself a note. I'm uh, going to make contact with them tomorrow and see what uh, safety messages that we can uh, coordinate with them to get out to the public. So thank you very much for that. <clears throat> uh, last month in CRR, uh, just another Typically busy month. Uh, we did 63 plans reviews uh, last month. I believe the month before was 62. So uh, it's just seems to be picking up and, and not letting letting down at all. Uh, we did have a couple of uh, notable events. Uh, we did have a structure fire on Brewer Road. Uh, that was the result of unattended cooking. Uh, one patient was sent to the burn unit due to their injuries from that fire. Uh, we also had a small brush fire out on Lloyd Butte Road. Again, that was a, another cooking fire, somebody cooking with charcoal briquettes. Um, it ended up being a very, fairly small fire, uh, less, than, uh, less than about uh, an eighth of an acre. Um, so uh, luckily we dodged a, a bullet there as well. Uh, engine company inspections, of course, so we're covering those on a quarterly basis. Um, we are with the new ESO software that we have. Uh, hopefully, we're going to have monthly updates on that as we're switching over. Uh, the crews will be recording those as they go, so they won't be coming through the uh, ArcGIS software. Um, so that's a change that we're making with Captain Wassel. He's working on that plan right now. So hopefully, in the next couple of months. Uh, that will all be switched over. The crews will be trained and, and they'll just be recording those inspections as they do those. 
the safety message this month is monsoon safety. Although it doesn't look like it out there today, uh, today is actually the first official day of monsoon season. Uh, with any luck, uh, in the next few weeks, we could get into that monsoonal pattern. I'm hoping for that. We need it desperately, and hopefully, unlike the last couple of years, it won't be a monsoon. We'll actually get some precipitation out of the whole deal. Uh, but being prepared for monsoon season, uh, it's it's all about planning ahead, staying abreast of the weather, uh, follow your weather radio, get your current weather forecast from the TV or the radio, have a disaster supply kit in your home. And, you know, these kits, you should have a disaster supply kit uh, for everything. You never know when that unexpected power outage is going to come. You never know exactly when that monsoon's going to hit. You never know what kind of calamity is going to befall you where you should have a few gallons of clean water for every person in the house and your pets. Don't forget that. A basic first aid kit. Uh, everybody should have a, a food supply that doesn't require cooking. Uh, Freeze-dried meals. You can buy kits um, in a bucket that uh, have a shelf life of 25 years. Uh, and you can feed your family for a week if something befalls you that you can't get out and cook food or get food or cook food. You just have to add water. Uh, portable uh, battery operated radio, flashlights with extra batteries. Um, all of those can be used not just in monsoon season, but uh, year round. Flash flood safety, uh, you know, more deaths occur every year in flooding uh, than any other thunderstorm related uh, hazard. Uh, people just don't understand the force of water. Um, and many of these deaths occur in automobiles that are swept downstream. Uh, everybody knows the slogan, turn around, don't drown. That is more important than ever during the monsoon season. Don't try to go over those low water crossings. Uh, just a couple of inches of fast moving water can sweep your car off the road and down the wash. Lightning safety, uh, much like turn around, don't drown, the lightning safety slogan, if when thunder roars, go indoors. If you can hear thunder, you're close enough to be struck by lightning. The other thing, which goes back to the disaster supply kit, is being prepared for uh, power outage and communication outages. Uh, again, in your supply kit, have that uh, electric battery operated radio and um, you should be good to go for this monsoon season and every monsoon season. Uh, that's all I have, end of report, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Do we have any questions? No, buy extra batteries. Buy extra batteries, they're cheap. Chief Davis, thank you very much. That's very uh, comprehensive and I uh, appreciate all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Chief Mazoulis, EMS Training Fleet, please take the floor. Good evening. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stall as it does the slow fade in. All right. Um, billing transition. As I mentioned last month, um, we had a, a transition in staffing with the billing company. So we did some resets on some things. Um, it's going well and they're processing claims as uh, Gabe mentioned, and we're starting to get an idea of what the new normal looks like so that we can develop our policies and procedures to reflect the needs of, of them doing our billing. Um, it's going well. I've got Chris Ahern back in the office full time and uh, we're getting the process down and learning it. And I, I'm hopeful that next month's report, um, we'll, we'll be talking about how it's flowing smoothly and we've made the transition complete. Um, with our refurbished ambulance, uh, to Heidi's point, we, we're still waiting on a couple parts and pieces, uh, manufacturer delays to plug it in and get it in service. But, um, and Mike Sheehan's been working on it in between keeping the rest of our fleet in service. And we've had a few warranty issues and in a, a few um, ambulance issues keeping them in service. We never dropped down below our four ambulance minimum, but uh, for example, we had one ambulance that um, 
was delayed a few weeks for repair because the Ford dealership was waiting on the clamps for the turbo kit. And if, if you don't know, it's it's essentially a hose clamp of, of sorts. And it's not a part you would expect that there would be a shortage of. So we're we're adapting and adjusting to uh, some of the supply chain issues all across the board. Um, let's see the training report. Our crews are continuing to train, um, trying to do some stuff, a lot of stuff online and in the station in the cool air. And we've got some EMS CEs and things for that. Uh, the, our partnership with NAH, uh, they help us to review all of our cardiac arrests and uh, provide good CE opportunities for that. So they're, they're assisting with us, keeping our training up as well. Um, as you can see, we sponsored a SAW class, which is uh, the forest requires us to uh, certify our, our Sawyers, which is the group of folks that can cut trees in the wildland. And that's important twofold. One, out when we're out on assignment, it enhances our ability to assist with the fire, but equally important, uh, it keeps our folks in district certified. So if we get a wildland incident, uh, we can work in concert with the Forest Service and they, we have a level of trust where we can get guys out with saws and help mitigate the emergency. So it's a good one. Uh, again, with our, our ROVA training, that's the uh, Recreational Off-Highway Vehicle Association. And it's a recognized certification that the Forest Service requires for us to utilize uh, our UTVs out on assignment. But as you know well, board, uh, we've been utilizing those UTVs quite a bit in district as well. So I think having that class enhances the safety of our members. And, and for those folks that are city dwellers that don't have a personal uh, recreational vehicle, it helps them to be safe operators. Uh, hosted a National Fire Academy safety officer class. That went well. It was well attended. It's one of the first uh, open format classroom trainings offered in Northern Arizona post COVID. And so we had attendance from all around the state. It was, it was a good deal. And uh, so far rescue training, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense right now with the creeks running so low, but um, as mentioned, we, we anticipate a monsoon season and we want to be prepared for it. And uh, lastly, with uh, this report, uh, Andrew Johnson, engineer Andrew Johnson completed his bachelor's degree. And that was a, that was a lot of hard work. Um, June is uh, our safety stand down month and the focus has been on rehab and our crews have been failing miserably um, with doing back to back hike outs. But uh, to your point, uh, Mr. Camella, I, I believe our captains and our battalion chiefs are doing an excellent job of keeping their crews hydrated and taking care of them. Um, and uh, we're just adjusting to this increase in, in you know, off off trail or out on trail uh, rescues and our guys are doing a great job. And with that, I'll open up to any questions or comments. Do you have any uh, questions for Chief Mazoulis? Chief, uh, I've got a quick one. One of our, our uh, utility vehicles, the off-road utility, utility vehicles respond. Are they trailered out or are they going code three on city streets? Uh, how do they actually get to the incident? Generally speaking, uh, we'll travel on surface streets. Uh, we, we purpose built our fleet of off highway vehicles with uh, street tires. They've got an all terrain, um, all terrain tire for safety, a highway tire. Uh, and, we, and we don't go code three with them. Um, they respond uh, following traffic laws and, and get to the incident. You know, typically the engine uh, will get on scene and establish command and, and plot the coordinates with the battalion chief and figure out where we're going and do all that. And then, and, um, the primary use of our UTVs is, you know, we, we get out five two five or we get out to the devil's bridge, for example, in the, in the West Sedona area. And, um, we haven't had a lot of issues with response time with them going, uh, following traffic rules and, and getting out to the scene. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you, chief. Chief Trotwin. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, I believe Chief Coyle is uh, available now from that briefing, so I'm going to defer to Assistant Chief Coyle. Hey, thank you, Chief. Um, hot off the press, right? And some good multitasking practice for this evening. Um, sorry, COVID-19, we're still in the, uh, the level of restrictions where masks are, are only required if you are unvaccinated. 
So that's still the kind of the posture there. Um, when it comes to significant incidents, you know, the, the chief touched on a couple of, we had a couple of fatalities. Are, are you guys hearing me okay? Let me get some feedback from the board. Yeah, we can hear you okay. Okay, good. All right, so um, the, the significant events, you know, we've had two fatalities on the trails. Um, Chief Baker did a wonderful job about putting a post up there, followed up with some of the, the media um, requests that came in. And of course, that's a law enforcement event. We're very sensitive about giving out names or being out, but we did not do that. Um, but we did think it was important to highlight the fact that that occurred because we've had a number of near misses and we had those two that, you know, ended catastrophically. So we wanted to make sure that that was getting out there and that people, you know, hopefully, you know, to, to Al's point earlier that they're taking appropriate actions. Um, you know, sometimes the, the level of, of ignorance uh, that we that we see out there is just is just shocking. It's things that you just intuitively think people would know better. Um, showing up with no water, some clothes that aren't designed for that environment. So, you know, we definitely struggle with getting the message out, but we continue to try. Uh, the other, you know, issue that was touched on a little bit earlier that I wanted to uh, to emphasize was the fact that you know these hike outs, you know, these multiple hike outs of crews. You know, part, the main thing that's keeping them safe is their physical fitness, their baseline physical fitness, and their ability to to um, to be uh, to operate in that environment because of that level of fitness. You know, and, and it was highlighted on one event where they, um, one of the ones that unfortunately ended in a fatality, where they went to three different locations that afternoon on Sunday to um, try to find that location, try to find the patient uh, because they knew it was urgent, but they didn't have um, an exact location. Uh, based on what came in through 911. And so you know, the crew's ability to do that and then still run calls is critical. It also means that it's critical for us not to put them in that environment unless it's absolutely necessary. So continue to try to improve how we triage those calls and you know really determine if someone needs rescue uh, before we expose the crews. And so it's, you know, there's not just a, they call, we go, it's, um, it was careful consideration by the battalion chiefs on what an appropriate response is like. So the other big, um, the other big issue that's occurred is, the, sorry, the, the feedback from the boardroom is squeaky and distracting. So I apologize that I keep stuttering. Um, is the, the, of course, the Cornville fire on Sunday night. You know, the, the briefing that I was just on the oral, the, um, the fire is now 74% contained, and remember the crews um, lost their, or the, the fire lost the Type 1 helicopter that you've been seeing in Sedona to a new start called the Manus Fire um, southwest of Luna. Uh, the helicopter's en route to, uh, to Springerville, Arizona right now. But the fire that uh, occurred, um, or the, sorry, the, the, the fire perimeter is relatively the same right now as it was um, the, the, the day after the fire started. So the crews been going around it the second time around it today and no perimeter growth. So that's looking really good. Um, hey, John Davis, did you hit on the cleanup? I apologize, I missed that. I did not. I'm sorry, I missed that. So go ahead and cover right. that if you'd like. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So we had the annual cleanup today and, or this, this last month, um, the end of May and the total hours worked by by residents to remove debris was 370 that they reported. And the total hours worked by the Sonoma Fire District staff for the event was 132. So, you know, it just kind of highlighted the fact that by providing that opportunity to the residents that we got three hours of work for every one hour we put into it. Um, and, you know, the crew, Jordan Baker and Bo had been leading up that effort on the ground, especially Paul. Jordan oversees it in the budget and everything in coordination with, with um, Fire Marshal John Davis. But Paul Chabot is the one that's been coordinating all those efforts on the ground and they do just an excellent job with that program. The report they, they provided this year uh, for um, the, the outputs and with the recommendations for next year was 10 times better, which is what I told them than anything I ever did when I ran that program. Um, so they talk about next year is moving it to an earlier time zone or earlier time, so April, to uh, maybe try to find a sweet spot to uh, reduce some of the traffic impacts. 
And then instead of holding it for four days up at you know, the location of station four, which used to be fine when traffic wasn't so bad, you know, people would come every day, we'd see them, but it seems like traffic is kind of limited, you know, the reach that that program has. So the idea is to have it, um, is to consider looking at having it two days at one location and two days at another. So still the same amount of cost for you know, staffing and everything for, you know, for sort of fire, but spread it out so we can get, so we can increase that ratio from three to one for what individuals contribute to what we contribute to even higher, which is, which is certainly the goal. Um, your wildland seasonal outlook, look, your wildland season is, a, is upon us in full force. Right now, fire danger is extreme. Um, the live fuel moistures are, have dropped 15% in all three of the different types of um, material that we that we measure, which is the, the pinion juniper, uh, the oak brush, and the manzanita. All of those are in critical levels right now. So that means even the live stuff is available as fuel. And, um, you know, it's things like creosote brush that doesn't tend to burn very well has been burning to white ash. So it's, which means it's been consuming completely is what that means because when all you see is little white skeletons of the main parts of the of the bushes on the ground and no other sign that there's even a bush there that's that's when you know fuels are dry and those are the conditions we're in right now um, you know that's there's some lightning that's occurred to the east and I've had that new mass fire started but most likely by lightning and there are some cells building just to our east none of it's expected to be rainmakers for us in the next three or four days so the biggest concern is going to be lightning and outflow winds from those storms. Um, moving on to the GIS updates, you know, some of the accomplishments that Emily's um, achieved in this last month is uh, the creation of survey. She worked, it's been pretty awesome. So guys will ask if there's something that she could maybe do to help them. In this case, it was with the UAS program to do a flight log. And she came back with a, a product uh, that was much better than what they even thought was possible. So it's it's taught me to just basically explain to her what we're trying to do and ask her if she has any ideas on how we can do it. You know, using GIS or remote sensing or any of the remote um, applications that she's familiarized herself with that Esri, the same people make our GIS software offer. And that's been far more productive. Another thing she did is our unavailability of ambulances she created a tracking code that the BCs have, it's one of those QR codes, all the squares with lots of little squares inside of it. And so whenever they have, uh, whenever they're out of ambulances, they can just click on that with their, with their battalion chief phone in their, in their rig, in the, in the BC rig, and automatically pulls up the form and they can note that stuff so we can start tracking that stuff more carefully. Um, uh, she completed an editing, the map, which is a huge edit, probably the biggest edit we've had in 10 years, those map books. And has sent out a survey to look at different ways to, um, to bind them, to see what, what people prefer. And then we'll be getting those out to the crews and um, developing a digital radio checkout system uh, in coordination with the, the wildland group there. Next month, she plan on attending some future training on um, GIS and still work on that next gen 911. So that's still a big effort for GIS is, again, that's that whole, um, as, we, as we transition our um, dispatching to the next generation 911 system, making sure that we have the backbone to support it. Telecom updates. You know, I asked for a, a list of some of the stuff that Jeremy's been up to to kind of highlight that today. And um, there's like 60 things, literally. And and I'm not going to read them all off to you. But what I tell you, what I tell you is that the examples include um, scrubbing machines for auction. Our sensitive data is protected when we when we something's end of life for us. Assisting end users with software and hardware issues, controlling and monitoring access, um, recording and posting videos, and uh, and working on software updates. You know, I'd say about 50% of his time is spent interfacing with the end user, and a lot of the rest of the time is spent you know, working on some of those projects in the background. Some of the other work that went on in the in the uh, telecom division this month is. We're still working on those five new microwave links to get them up and running and working on issues with the, the voice over IP phone and then uh, an upgrade request by um, by T-Mobile Sprint, the fiber upgrade to station three and four and, and reviewing those requests. Um, some of the problems that they had to deal with this month were Mingus to the Squaw Peak microwave went down and 
trouble trouble report for Sedona PD channel one and Copper Canyon fire channel 11 having uh, intermittent interference. So upcoming, some exciting stuff that's gonna be accomplished soon, let's say in the next month, continue to work to repair that, that, that microwave problem with the five links or with the five microwave links that had software issues. Um, continue to work on them specifically the microwave link to squaw and then uh, put a new radio um, or standing up the radio alerting in Copper Canyon's new station and then the Sedona police radio upgrade. And finally, um, phone system upgrade and end user input. So our phone system is end of life. And so Heidi is um, working with whoever she designates, but to make sure that somebody in administration that we get good end user requirements and desires on that phone system. Because you know, I could look at the different phone systems and Bob could too, and he could look at them for a technical aspect. I can look, well, that looks like a dandy phone system, but I don't use the phone system every day. And so we want to make sure that we have the opportunity for those end users, because it's user support, right? We call it user support services. So making sure that the end user is actually getting supported and not the way that I think that they should be supported or Bob thinks they should be supported, but in the way that actually helps them do their job. So sounds maybe like semantics, but it's, I think it's critical to make sure that we're doing it right. And, and finally, something that um, just came across too is that we were working on the, the, the position description updates for everyone that reports to the chief, make sure we have accurate, accurate job descriptions. Um, so, you know, when one of us wins the lottery, we need to hire for those positions that we know exactly what it is. And so people know what their roles and responsibilities are and how to carry them out. And it looks like based on the timeline that they're going to be um, continue to do the one-on-one -on -one interviews with the other person I already did mine and then getting back with the chief. And then we should have some rough staff reports by the end of this calendar month. And so hopefully um, we'll have an update for you on where that's at with those new JDs um, towards you know, at the next board meeting. End of report. Any questions? <laughs> Boom. Yeah, we do. Uh, uh, Al? Uh, Kamau here. Um, I'm curious, the Cornville fire, does anybody know what started it, or was it a mystery? Well, is that there's not? no lightning. Yeah. So I'm going to call it human-caused, um, exact cause under investigation. Uh, I don't know. They, they had law enforcement there at the origin. Um, you know, but I, no, so I'm not trying to be snarky. I <laughs> I don't know, but there's no lightning. So, you know, odds are it had something to do with a human. I'm just not sure. Um, I haven't heard anything else. Uh, and I hate to speculate. But. I know that uh, well, <clears throat> G Burger made a lot of money on that first day for the traffic that was, couldn't go through on corn. <laughs> Chief, a uh, quick question for you. Uh, I know there was aircraft in the in the air pretty doggone quick. Were we able to utilize our uh, unmanned aerial uh, drone? No, no, there was, no, uh, we, we weren't. It's, you know, we, we, we really, we're not set up to fly within a TFR. There's ways to do it. Um, but if we would have, in this instance, we would have basically caused them to shut down their air show. So it never even kind of be, became a thing that we even considered. They did have uh, air attack, so you know, fixed wing with a pilot and a separate person that has all the radio frequencies going over the fire, coordinating, providing that, you know, like um, air tactical guidance, and and then all of the aircraft, including large uh, rotary helicopters like the one that was stationed or that's up at the airport or was up at the airport, and then the 747s or the sorry the DC-10s and the um, and the new advanced large air tankers. So. Those, those are jet, the, even the air attack and the lead planes, those aircraft, the one of the reasons they get back so fast is they can get back quickly in between, but they have to slow down when they get into airspace for around the fire and within the TFR because the planes that are supposed to show them where to go can't fly near as fast as they can. And so it's already a super complex thing. So we, we did not introduce any more complexity. Got it. Chief, where did the aircraft come out of primarily? It, for this instance, they're primarily out of Portachuca, Mesa Gateway, and San Bernardino, and most of the, the um, 
the load and returns were done out of Mesa Gateway. Okay, thank you. Bet. Well, again, Chief, uh, thank you for all the joint effort between the agencies uh, with this fire. I know it could be a, a daunting task that everybody get on the same page, but uh, it seems like they did do it and they did it pretty doggone fast. So again, thank everybody for all their hard work on the fire ground. Yes, sir, I'll pass it on. Thank you. All righty, Chief. All right, thank you. Just, I, I wanna go back to one thing on our cleanup, just to make a note, public note. Uh, we were able to secure a grant to assist with that this year, and Eric Walter did all the legwork on that, and it was through Yavapai County, so it's grant money available that we've never tried with them before, but for wildland type mitigative uh, efforts. So that worked nice to staff it really effectively, and I think you know we'll continue that as a practice moving forward. I want to say, and John can correct me if I'm wrong, was it $5,500? Does that sound right, John? I believe it was $5,250, if I remember correctly, but it was right in that neighborhood. Yes, sir. A lot of fives in it. So so I was uh, pretty close. But I want to make a note that that, that was very, uh, the county supervisor or county has that fund available every year. So we were able to tap into it and get that grant to assist with it. And, and what did we use it for? What was it utilized for? I, I missed that. It was utilized for the, the dumpsters, dumpsters and the staffing. Gotcha. Just to enhance the program. So we made sure we could pack everything in really well and get the most vegetation possible. So Got it. Thank you. So I want to make a note of that, Eric Walter, and then just that we were able to use those county funds. Yes. That was, there was an article on it in the Red Rock. It's good. Yeah, very good. So we'll continue that as a practice. That's always a good note when we can, one, secure grant money, but two, it's for mitigated methods efforts like that sure you know we know they're very effective okay so uh just to close out our strategic plan we finished our what i call the head to toe on it like a paramedic would assess someone on a trauma but uh so we're our all our goals and our strategies and action eyes have been updated so we're at to where the next step really is loading it back into our platform to track it and then uh, get our small work groups working on the different tasks to complete those actions. So a very exciting, you're gonna hear more about that that we'll uh, lay out here probably coming into July. But uh, you know, that's going very well. You can see we had a number of purchase orders between 10 and 50,000, our door lock security for 14,000, MS software support for 21,000 and thermal imagers. And, uh, you can see also, and this came up earlier uh, in terms of our social media and outreach, and you know, we talked about the chamber and what we have been getting an incredible increase, as you can see, a significant increase this last month. Now, maybe that is because of travelers and they're trying to game out coming up here and what they want to do, but I think the other part is just the, the weather and wildland season, all the rescues that we are doing. You know, people are interested in keeping safe in general. So, you know, that's been a great platform. And again, uh, you can see a lot of the a lot of interest in the fires and the rollovers, uh, and just in the general information that we're providing. So finally, uh, again, we've had some very nice correspondence and thank you letters that we've attached to the end of our our report here. Uh, please take some time to look at that. Uh, you know, one of those ones there. You even have pictures on the rollover accident that the individuals were involved in, and they took the time to write a nice thank you and letter on uh, our firefighters and their professionalism and how they took care of the medical needs, how they took care of the extrication needs, and how they carefully did it. And you can look, it doesn't look like the car did so well, but fortunately, more importantly, the people did. And I think that's to a large effort to our training and response and then how our firefighters really handled that. So always good to see that and know that. but. Uh, just know that's a day-to-day -day occurrence of our firefighters. They're handling business. So we may not see it every day or talk about it, but they are. And I think that highlights it quite nicely. So that is the end of the chief report, unless there are any further questions. Uh, any questions for the chief? No, sir. Uh, chief, uh, a quick one was uh, any update on fire station <coughs> 4 moving forward with any facet of yeah, the only update will be uh, we'll start our uh, feasibility study here probably after the fiscal year. Okay. But we've slowed the roll based on construction costs and availability of materials. But the next fiscal year, the plan will be get through feasibility study, the first phase. There's going to be two phases to that. 
have our internal staff look at that, evaluate it, and then give direction for a second phase, which will be more detailed. Then hopefully seek out some kind of a plan and engineering design you know, with the cost of that so that we're lined up very nicely as materials become more prevalent, as construction costs come down a bit. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next item on the agenda is discussion, possible action, letter from the city manager's office regarding prospective multifamily housing project within the Southwest Center subdivision. Chief Troutline. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, let me pull the document up. <coughs> we received a letter from the city manager and essentially, uh, First, it took me by surprise, and I had staff look at it. I mean, they don't typically ask the fire district about different developments. Where the fire district comes in is through our CRR division, where we do very careful plan checks, because our goal ultimately is, as the building and is the city and the county goes through their building permitting process, that they want to keep the builder accountable to all the building safety codes, and then our big focus is really the fire code. So we want that building, the ingress, egress to it, all the systems to be up to standard. And that's very critical for us. So that's really where we put all our weight in. We don't typically comment on developments across the community. That's really for the city and the county to work with the residents on and then we make sure that building in and of itself has the correct fire code requirements. So this came up, it came to us city manager was asking the fire district, hey, would this be okay? Well, the backstory is I talked to the city manager on it is evidently station one, this station is in a more or less HOA that was formed about 50 years ago. And certain parcels uh, that, that when they develop and within that HOA require a two third vote of the HOA. <laughs> so we fell in as a voter and I was like, okay. So I thought it'd be prudent just to bring it to the board, make you aware. Um, you can see from the letter and then the the design picture there, it's, it's a little difficult, a little blurry, but what the city's intent is, is to develop the parcels that they own. This would be for some uh, apartments, low income housing. One of the challenges that the city's having that the city manager um, shared with me is uh, attracting individuals that want to work for the city. They actually have uh, a number of positions that are open now and they've been challenged to fill those positions. Not that they haven't had qualified applicants, but when the applicants got down to it, if they didn't already live here, they were challenged to even find an apartment to live in. So there's several points of plan. One of them is this development and they're hoping that at least the district would support something like that. And, and there's other plans that they're working on. So where this came in is just looking to the board for their input and approval. If they'd like us to correspond with the, the uh, city and give them a vote of approval as an HOA voter. Uh, for my, my position, I, I, uh, I know it's a very complex question, at least across the community in terms of housing and what kind of housing and where. So. As a fire chief, I am going to tell you, my CRR division does an excellent job and I'm going to continue to direct them to focus on the planning part where the fire code is enforced. Other than that, the only concern I have, which we have shared already, is um, as we respond out of Station 1, when you get down to Southwest Drive and the 89A, we already have an influx of traffic there. And, you know, where we're not responding on the incident, we have all driven out of here even tonight, right, where you wait, 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 and it's free, you get in the middle. Well, now our responders are responding code three on incident, so that's a concern, although ADOT is looking at that to do a warrant study to see if it deserves a light or some kind of warning device. So that was the only request when I talked to city manager. Yeah, we, we want to make sure that when you do a development here, you know, in this open area. That's what we're talking about, this big open field. Yes. That there's an impact to traffic in our response that hopefully, you know, that warrant study would show that so that we can update that. Now, hey, that's up to the data and the numbers. We don't have any, you know, access to that. That's the engineers that look at that. So, but we would bring it to their attention. So other than that, uh, you know, our focus really is the CRR component of, of all these developments. 
you know, the solution, I don't know that me as the fire chief would weigh in on a solution for housing in the city of Sedona. <laughs> I might have opinions, but you can get those at my house when we're having dinner and we're not talking about anything else, but just because we live here. But so anyway, just looking for a direction from the board on whether they would want us to vote as an approver so that the city could move forward, obviously, and go through all their normal plan process, which there's public hearings and all that. So. Yeah, I, I, I would venture to guess that the direction given to you on, on this particular item would be to stay engaged with, with the ongoing discussions as to what's happening. Bless you. Uh, what's happening. Um, I, would, I would also like to see it and, and ensure that we have say or at least it's weighted that a signal there that we can activate as we respond out you know from quarters that gets it red for cross traffic so we can get out of here because there will be an influx of traffic as a result of that um, at the very least and I would like to you know my one wreck in 22 years was right here making a left-hand turn yeah. and I was flipped over in the middle of the highway now you were all there in 30 seconds to rescue me, <laughs> but <clears throat> there was no traffic light. Yeah. I did drive right into the path of a truck. Yeah. So it does happen. So whatever comes about of that, I think that's the one thing that we should really focus it on from my point of view. But as far as a vote for the Homeowners Association, um, it would probably just be a single singular vote. I mean, just one check, not five. But um, Maybe we get clarity on that. What is it that they really want from us as a homeowner? Yeah, because we're within that homeowner. They're looking for our one vote Yeah. because they want the two-thirds from all the other property owners. So that's all. Yeah, it would, it would be literally me corresponding with them saying that, yeah, the fire district will give you approval of vote. You know, our concern is that intersection. And we would ask for the warrant study to continue to make sure if there is an impact there that that would be handled appropriately. Okay. based on the data and the engineering, et cetera. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm, I'm a little confused here, perhaps. Um, the vote would be then, or their approval is not from the board, but from the fire chief. Is that correct? Because to have the board involved with the homeowners association, I don't see, I don't see the need for that. Yeah, no, this is, uh, this is an interesting thing. That's why I'm bringing it to you because no one knew what to do with it. But again, it appears that the fire district being a property owner here at station one would be a voter, one vote. Yes, normally the fire chief would vote, but I think because of the complexity of the, the, uh, the issue, I definitely want input here publicly. And if there was some grave concern, <laughs> that would probably you know, funnel our vote, or if the board was telling me, yeah, Chief, we don't really think that would be a good idea, then we would vote accordingly. Why don't we also run it by legal just to get a, a an opinion? I did. Yeah. He said, yeah, put it on the agenda and <laughs> bring it in front of the board to see what their input and recommendation is. So this that. is legal's advice. <laughs> yeah, okay. I literally yeah. almost drafted the letter and fired it off, and I thought, maybe I'll give legal a call. And he said, oh, put it on the agenda, bring it in front of the board, let them read it. Let them know we're going to do a vote. And again, I, my thought is if, if there's some direction that there's concern by the board to allow the area to develop as a homeowner association, we can surely vote one. Publicly, I would recommend that we support the city in the effort because, again, uh, the process, they still have to go through the normal process. This is just to get them to be able to engage that if they get enough votes. So do we want a, a consensus of the board now? Sure. Okay. Yeah. This, the consensus would be to to uh, to vote in a positive manner, a, po a positive form, uh, to, in support of this project. So, with that being said, uh, a consensus. Do we have a consensus of a positive vote no. for this development um, project? No. We have a no. Would we have over here? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we'll turn to Mr. Whittington. Oh, uh, well. <laughs> so what, what we do, got. What do we know? We got two no's, and we got to, to not cast a positive vote in favor of this. Well, how could, but we, why? But we don't want to cast a negative vote. 
Well, we'll negative vote. We just we can if we wanted to and say no, we're not in favor of it. Now, why would we vote that? Again, I, I don't know. Again, um, um, maybe it's my confusion. Um, I, I particularly don't want to, uh, to get involved in a homeowners association, not just this one, but others. It well, opens up. It could open up. A, yeah. Yeah. I think by virtue of being physically being here, this this structure, we are part of this. We are a member. Yeah. We are a member, a voting member. But uh, I would say that we, at this point, why don't we table this till next meeting, till next and agendize it for next meeting as we did today, and we will then have a little bit more dialogue with Bill. Yeah, we can get further direction. Yeah. I, I don't know what the vote, what she's asking for, other than there's a process going on for a developer to build, I think, 80 apartments over here, uh, and traffic will be an issue. I, to me, it's a big issue. Traffic, sewer, um, uh, order. The, the need for housing is, is real, but more importantly, it's free enterprise. He's buying a piece of land. He's going through the process, um, and so be it. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that's when I asked for legal for clarity. He thought it would be a good idea to get input from the board again. I don't know that we have a precedent on the fact that one of our properties is in an HOA where we are a voter. You know, we don't have any policy procedures or bylaws that say, well, the fire chief votes, or <laughs> no, the board chair votes, no, the director of management votes. Yeah. So that, that to me, why I think it's okay for us to have this discussion, because we'll yeah. set a precedent, and if the direction ultimately is, yeah, let the fire chief just make those decisions, that's fine with me. but. You know, I don't want to overstep my bound, and since we don't have a precedent and there isn't, like, real clear direction, gray areas, then, you know. What I don't understand is why did it go to the association in the first place? You know, what... It is. We, are, the, we are part of the association. Uh, what power does the association have in this subject? Um, it seems abstract to me. Yeah, no, re related to this... And again, this was the form. It sounds like the city started engaging a process to develop these parcels. They found out from legal that there was an HOA and certain parcels in this area in that HOA require a two-thirds vote of the HOA for approval to move forward with developing those parcels. The city's parcels fall in that HOA so requirement. So this is land owned by the city. Yes. But it's in this HOA, and the requirement for their parcels is to get a two-third approval by the HOA to move forward with their development plan. We, we, because of 50 years ago and our properties here, we're an HOA voter. One vote, yes. So that's why we got pulled into it. Normally, and, and by the way, yeah. Oh, well, that's good, too. What's that? We, we could abstain, you know. Because I want to say normally our position is, and not that I don't get phone calls or people calling or sending letters, and same thing with CRR, why are you allowing that to be billed? We're asking the fire district to say no. And we say, well, you're, you're engaging the wrong forum. If it's the county building and permitting, they have a process. So there's public hearings. We don't do public hearings on buildings. You go through the county. If, the, if it's the city proper, they have process. So the fire district does not weigh in on developments. This is unusual because we're in an HOA. So but what we weigh in on is that project, that building, will comply with the fire code. We'll make sure, we'll enforce it, we'll follow up it. So our, our, our weight, my weight, is always when I get engaged by these developers, is we're not going to comment on that, but go through the normal process. And if it, the plan check ends up on Chief Davis's desk, we're going to make sure it's compliant with fire code, period. I like Heidi's I like comment. the abs abstaining. Abstaining. It's just uh, not negative or positive. It just, it's, it's, it's almost yeah. a neutral position because why put a dog in the fight? Yeah, and, and is this HOA active? I don't think so. I think it's something on the books that's been outstanding. It's 50 years old. Hmm. So and I don't think anyone's developed property within this well, you get some attorneys involved, it could be very active, so. Right, so, but if they miss that point, then there's going to be a problem downstream, and that's why I think they're just trying to make it clean, so. Well, I think, I think, I think staff brings up a good point about the abstention. I think the consensus that was asked 
uh, I don't think it was incomplete because not all the board members voted. Um, and it's also a, a, a position that the board does not want to be involved with for the reasons you just stated. You know, the, co the community could look at it on, on any which way. Um, I would like to table it until next month, as stated, and get clarity from legal one on one or at the next board meeting and and then a motion to to vote one way or the other of which the abstention may be the right vote to do so we'll we'll uh defer that till next month okay excellent okay thank you <clears throat> next item on the agenda is the uh discussion possible action review and approval of the intergovernmental Agreement for Telecommunication Network with Copper Canyon Fire and Medical District. Chief Troutwine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, as we've gone through our different telecommunication agreements and updated, th this one came up uh, to update before it expired. And uh, we do provide some IT service to, it's, it's now known as Copper Canyon Fire District. You'll see from the, the board communication uh, when these agreements were signed, it was Camp Verde Fire District that we provided service to and Montezuma Rimrock Fire District. Since those two agencies have merged into Copper Canyon Fire District. So really this IGA is an update to that. Now we've corrected it where they are merged. It's under Copper Canyon. Uh, the fees that we charge them, uh, it stayed consistent in terms of the annual service fee. The one thing that we changed, we did an evaluation on uh, if we if we go beyond the typical service in the agreement, then we have the latitude to charge an hourly rate. So, for example, if Copper Canyon Fire District wanted to do some project that's outside the scope of this agreement, then we we use our IT people and get it done. But then we charge them an hourly rate. We evaluated that hourly rate, and it was low based on years ago when that was established. So we updated that. But other than that, the annual fee. It's pretty consistent with where it's been and where it's headed. Um, you know, the agreement didn't change at all, other than now it's clear that it's one fire district, not two. And again, that hourly rate, if we get into an issue where there is a project that we are doing that's outside the scope of that agreement, then yes, we charge them an hourly rate. And it's more, the one we put in is, is more consistent with what our cost is. Okay. Gotcha. Any questions for the chief on that? No. No. Okay. Uh, Janet, would you like to make the motion? Yes. I motion to move to approve the, telecommuni the telecommunications intergovernmental agreement for Copper Canyon Fire and Medical District as presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. The motion carries. Thank you, Chief. Okay, and the last item on the agenda is uh, board member items, discussion, board members, fire department, or fire district related activities since the last board meeting. And again, I'll, I'll start with Al. Well, <coughs> um, the uh, fire district posted a, uh, a dealing with a preparation around your home and uh, for safety for fire, and so I followed. I reposted that and got some some movement from people that know me or at least know my Facebook. <clears throat> but the most of the uh, Cornville fire, I posted three or four things, including some videos. And um, so a lot of people, even people that don't even live in Arizona, know that uh, we had a fire. <clears throat> I'd also like to bring up that as of July one for a year, I'll be the chair of the Chamber of Commerce. So I'll have a unique position where I'll be running all the meetings and things, and if we can take advantage of that to uh, improve our uh, linkage to the chamber, especially on uh, fire safety, as well as um, uh, the issue of our visitors and the crazy things they do that bring us out to try to rescue them from doing um, less than uh, safe uh, protocol of hiking and climbing rocks that maybe they shouldn't climb. And so uh, 
That'll be as of July 1. That'll be my new role for a one year. I hope I survive it. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations, Al, uh, on that, and we'll look forward to working with you and the chamber uh, as we do that. They are, they are looking to hire uh, new people in-house uh, that would be doing their social media. Right now they're subcontracting that out. But um, I think if we had the right way to link with them, uh, especially the visitor center and the volunteers at the visitor center, um, they encounter tourists asking about hiking all the time. And this is where the proper protocol of hiking safely uh, is a direct connection with visitors. Yep. Thank you. Gene? Well, I don't know how many uh, other fire districts might have you um, have the benefit of board members being able to uh, dial up and talk to their fire chief and share information and so on and so forth. So I certainly found it, uh, it's, you're just a dime away, well, you know, a phone call away, and I appreciate that, Chief. Um, our, our conversations are, um, are certainly beneficial to me. I, I certainly don't know everything that's going on, and your willing to sh willingness to share, keep me up to speed, I, I appreciate that. I don't always uh, make the phone call. Uh, I'm, I'm eight miles away, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm retired, and so, but anyway, I'm being facetious, but, but the point being is I do appreciate the time that you spend uh, with, with me and the others and so on. It's very helpful for, under, for us to understand our roles. Thank you. Janet? Yeah, yes, I was actually going to say the same thing. I had a one-on-one -on -one with the chief this month, and um, he uh, explained and, and made clear some things to me. And now I can understand the procedures better. So it was a very helpful meeting. Excellent. Super. Thank you. And last but not least, me. Uh, <laughs> as usual, Chief, just you know, staying engaged as I as I have been uh, in the previous months. Uh, again, thanks to the entire staff, JVG, for uh, you know getting this budget together. A lot of work, uh, and uh, every every penny is going to go to good use. Uh, also. The ongoing work with all of our legal documents with other agencies coming together. Uh, there is kind of light at the end of the tunnel, getting things back in order. Sometimes things like that just get away from you, and now we're bringing them back. Um, another fiscal year has come to an end. Another one's about ready to begin, and I think we've got a pretty pretty bright future for this for this district as a whole. And we got just under 100 people working all in that same direction moving forward. So with that said, it's been a pleasure this past year. I look forward to, to a, another good fiscal year, and uh, that's all I've got. So with that said, this meeting is adjourned. Oh, Al. I just, is there any report on the filling of the open board position? Uh, good question. Let me, I'd like to ask Carrie, if you give us a breakdown on the time schedule uh, on what to expect and when. What other uh, 
ways did we communicate with the public? Um, so the article in the newspaper went out. We sent out. We have an email contact list. So if you're subscribed to that, you get that. Um, it goes out there and then it's and then word of mouth. Staff is aware of it. Um, there's been some word of mouth uh, sharing. Okay. Sen, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, the first deadline for resumes and uh, letter of interest, I think you mentioned, is June 30th? Correct. That along with the questionnaire, and so that'll give you um, probably a couple weeks to get that questionnaire evaluated for each candidate. Okay. And then sometime in July, end of July, we'll be doing interviews? Yes. So the new board member would be seated by August, by the August board meeting. That'll be within the 90 days then. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that for or Al? I think we've got pretty much covered it. Um, and again, thanks for putting all that together again with staff. And I think HR even had a hand with pulling out the old questions that we had before. So uh, thanks with admin and, and everyone doing that. So with that said, unless there's anything else to comment on, this meeting is adjourned. Can I touch this?